The American Public Health Association is committed to improving public health and achieving equity in health status. This year, we are incredibly excited to welcome all our members back, virtually and in person, to Denver to share the latest in research and public health leadership. This is APHA TV. It is the moment we've all been waiting for as APHA comes to Denver, Colorado with attendees gathering from all across the country, both in person and virtually. We'll be bringing you some of the highlights from the meeting, including interviews with featured speakers, prominent public health figures, as well as visiting centers around the country doing innovative work in the field. On the show today, we will join APHA Executive Director, Dr. Georges Benjamin, for a warm welcome to this year's annual meeting. But this is going to be a great meeting. We're going to have over 9,000 people participating either virtually um, or here in Denver. Speak to Dr. David Grossman about APHA's new partnership with Kaiser Permanente. This year we kicked off a new community health leadership program with APHA, offering scholarships and fellowships. Visit the centers at the forefront of violence and injury prevention research and make sure to stand by for our exclusive conversation with CDC Director Dr. Rochelle Walensky on her thoughts about the current state of public health. Really importantly, um, health equity is going to be something that we are going to address. And now over to Dr. Georges Benjamin at the Colorado Convention Center. Hi, I'm Dr. Georges Benjamin. I'm the Executive Director at the American Public Health Association. And we're here in Denver getting ready to start our 2021 uh, annual meeting. Um, we have, uh, you know, had a tough year and I'm just here to celebrate all of our public health heroes. You know, our opening session is not to be missed. We have um, Ms. Heather McGee, who is a social scientist, who's gonna talk a bit about um, her issues around social connectiveness. We've got a Monday general session uh, well, we have Dr. Bill Fagey. Dr. Bill Fagey is, of course, a very well-known and famous public health practitioner, a past APHA president, who have a very special message for us. Uh, we're also going to talk a bit about, um, really, how do we rebuild the public health system um, during that uh, conversation. And then our closing general session, we are going to talk about um, health equity and kind of pivot towards frankly, our 150th anniversary, which is next year in Boston. But this is going to be a great meeting. We're going to have over 9,000 people participating either virtually um, or here in Denver. We are um, looking forward to engaging one another in new and interesting ways and, and discussing the best science. So I welcome you all here to APHA 2021, the event of the year. APHA TV is brought to you from the 2021 APHA Annual Meeting. You can find us in person at the Colorado Convention Center, in select hotels, and on the homepage of the meeting platform, as well as on our YouTube channel and Twitter feed. Bienvenidos a APHA 2021. I'm Jose Ramon Fernandez Peña and I am the president of APHA. Welcome to APHA 2021. What a year this has been, right? Over the past year as president of the association, I've had the opportunity to visit affiliates across the country and to hear and learn from all the work that you have been doing in your regular lives as health professionals and also specifically in regards to dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. I am impressed and I'm grateful for all of your work. I'm excited about my session on Tuesday entitled Lessons Learned, How We Can Better Respond to the Next Pandemic. I'll be joined by a group of experts to talk about what we did right, what we did wrong, and how we should prepare for future public health crises. Please join us. For those of you in Denver, I really wish I was there with you, and I look forward to rubbing elbows with you in Boston next year when we will be celebrating our 150th anniversary. For those of you attending virtually like me, there is still so much to be gained from the meeting. No matter how you're attending, I encourage you to make the most of this opportunity. With so much happening, you likely need to watch some sessions on demand after the meeting, 
just because there are so many compelling and informative sessions happening at the same time. Welcome again and have a great meeting. We now head to our first of our featured research centers, the Center for Violence Prevention at University of Texas Medical Branch, where the faculty and staff are working to address violence through evidence-informed programs. I'm Dr. Jeff Temple. I am the founding director of the Center for Violence Prevention at the University of Texas Medical Branch. We're out there researching, we're providing evaluation services, and really a resource to learn more about violence, to learn what works to prevent violence, and hopefully at the end of the day, prevent violence. I think our work with CVP has really helped us bring new ideas to Texas Family Violence Programs on how to expand their reach when it comes to prevention education. So when we're talking about violence prevention, yes, we're talking about domestic violence and we're talking about dating violence, but we're also talking about larger systems of violence. And we're working to not only see it and understand it, but to actually change it. So I think that the center has done amazing work in creating deeper policy that will not only impact the moment in time, but the next generation. Now to the CDC's National Center for Injury Prevention and Control, where researchers have been tracking data and trends for more than 20 years. For almost 30 years, the Injury Center has really been the leading place for violence and injury prevention. And over that time, we have um, put out guidance, evidence, best practices, and really moved the field forward for what public health can do to prevent suicide, overdose, violence, as well as other unintentional injury topics. Many people have been impacted during the pandemic, and it's a really opportune time, I think, to look at where we can build resiliency, how we can prevent this. Never has there been more a pivotal time to be involved in public health. The Injury Center has three key topical areas, adverse childhood experiences, overdose, and suicide. These priorities are really important because they intersect. If you can prevent one early on, you can prevent the others. My hope is that we can fulfill our mission of everyone, everywhere, every day safe from injuries and violence. That is the ultimate goal. The APHA has recently partnered with Kaiser Permanente on a series of new programs and partnerships. And here to tell us about what that is, is Dr. David Grossman. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. Dr. Grossman, you lead Kaiser Permanente's social health strategy. Why is it important for such a large medical system to collaborate with public health? Well, I think uh, over these past 18 months, we've learned quite a bit about uh, public health and also the intersection with uh, care delivery um, because of the pandemic. At Kaiser Permanente, we believe that being healthy isn't just the result of high quality medical care, um, but also our care system needs to be connected to the community as well, because that's where much of uh, health is determined. So we take full accountability for the health of our members and have always emphasized preventive care to keep them healthy. But clinical preventive services will only take you so far. We need to go deeper and address those social, those social determinants of, of health as well. We have some examples um, where we've invested, for example, in, in, into a major economic development strategy that helps uh, local businesses recover, rebuild, and grow, um, providing greater capital for the development of commercial districts, um, improving the overall economic environment for people, um, as well as for um, providing um, safe and affordable housing uh, for people. We've also been focused on food and ensuring that people have access to secure food. And then uh, finally, we've also been working a lot with public health on COVID vaccine um, to promote vaccine confidence um, and to engage community-based organizations like churches, schools, and other trusted community hubs. What can you learn from public health and what can public health learn from Kaiser Permanente? Well, we certainly, I think, learned a great deal during this pandemic already. Um, and we remain really fully, deeply committed to connecting the public health infrastructure um, and improving it. 
Can you tell us about some of the programs and partnerships that you currently have with APHA? So just this year, we kicked off a new community health leadership program with APHA, offering scholarships and fellowships uh, to emerging and diverse public health leaders attending outstanding public health programs in our service footprint. And then we're also participating in the APHA Film Festival with a showing of the Way Home documentary film series on homelessness, a documentary about the lived experience of the homeless, and also providing some innovative and demonstrating some innovative solutions. The film, um, the films have been made by an independent filmmaker with our support. And I, I just really want to encourage everyone to that's attending the conference to attend the screening. Um, I think they'll find both the screening as well as the panel discussion to follow um, extremely interesting. Dr. Grossman, always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your interest and um, thanks for all that you're doing. Next up, we hear from the experts at the New Jersey Gun Violence Research Center, whose cutting edge research is focused on all aspects of gun violence prevention. Gun violence is undoubtedly a public health issue. Large scale interventions could help save lives. The Rutgers School of Public Health is based on two really important tenets, social justice and health equity. One of the things that sets the New Jersey Gun Violence Research Center apart is that we are one of only a few uh, state-funded gun violence research centers in the country. We're driven by the need of data from our organizers on the ground. Rutgers Gun Violence Research Center does this perfectly because we go closest to the people who are closest to the problem. We're putting equal weight behind the notion of communicating about the science of gun violence prevention. We want to establish what we call equal partnerships with community partners so that they feel as though they are an integral part of the research that we're doing. Our research has to work with individuals who are already on the ground as community partners, but in a way that recognizes the genius that's already there in those communities. The Johns Hopkins University Center for Injury Research and Policy has been on front lines of injury prevention for decades. Let's join them for a look at their work. What we're seeing, unfortunately, all over the world is a rising number of human rights violations, and not just against individual activists or dissidents, but against populations and whole communities. This public health and human rights work where both rights violations and the health of populations is threatened is enormously challenging work. I'm incredibly proud of, of our faculty and staff and students who engage in this work and we really feel that it's essential for scientists and public health people to be there. Our vision is that whenever public health interventions are undertaken, that human rights considerations will be at the heart of those efforts, and also that the human rights movement will gain traction, credibility, and, and heft from the use of these scientific public health tools. We are now honored to be joined by CDC Director Dr. Rochelle Walensky. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today and share your overall thoughts on public health. I'm so delighted to be here. So what do you see for the year ahead in public health? To start, I'm just looking forward to us turning the corner on this pandemic, increasing the number of people who get vaccinated, including soon, I hope, our children, so we can get back to school, get back to work, and get our life back to the way we it used to be. Um, I'm really looking forward to the results of the work we are starting to do in rebuilding our public health infrastructure so that we can be prepared for any pandemics and for public health in the future. And I'm really excited to see what this year will bring as we begin to focus on that and see the results of this huge investment that we've made in $7.4 billion for the American Rescue Plan to recruit and hire the public health workers that we've needed to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic, but also to prepare us for our public health um, challenges of the future. And along with combating COVID-19, what is your top priority to improve the public's health? 
You know, when I became CDC director, I came as a practicing physician treating patients who had to make impossible choices between filling prescriptions and putting food on their plates. So I've witnessed firsthand the impact of health inequities on individuals and families who had little or no access to regular care. Um, So really importantly, um, health equity is going to be something that we are going to address not only for the COVID-19 pandemic, but um, for all of public health. What will it take for the public to gain confidence in science as well as the CDC once again. Um, We are making huge strides in that. I hope the people at CDC are truly dedicated, hardworking individuals who care deeply about the health and safety of um, the public and of all Americans and truly of all people around the world. Um, They are up tirelessly working long hours, day and night, um, and you will never know their names and you will never know the hard work that they are doing. So my focus is to have science lead the way and to ensure transparency. Um, It's critically important that we not only use that science to inform policy, but then to communicate that as a critical intervention to save lives and communicate it clearly to the public. We are nearly two years into this pandemic now. Is there anything that you would like to share with the public health workforce? Absolutely. First, I want to share my gratitude and acknowledge this huge and heavy, unprecedented burden that has um, impacted our our public health workforce. Um, And I want to say to them, and I've said this to many in the public health field already, thank you for staying and enduring the course, for doing all that you have done during really trying times. So please do not neglect yourselves. Um, We will get through this together, and I am so grateful for your sticking through it. We are with you 100%. APHA is about to mark its 150th anniversary. How has APHA impacted you specifically? And looking forward, is there anything that you hope APHA will tackle? Collaboration is just critically important during these challenging times. So first, I just want to thank APHA, congratulate them, um, thank them for being an exceptional partner, congratulate them on this incredible anniversary. Um, the, the success of APHA is the success of CDC. Our, all ships rise in this. And I just want to um, say that I hope that we can continue battling our common foes together, um, whether they are in infectious diseases, firearm violence, opioid epidemic, health inequality, mental health. Um, we are in this together with you. Congratulations and happy anniversary. Dr. Walensky, once again, thank you so much for your time today. We appreciate it. Thanks again to Dr. Walensky for her thoughts. That's it for our first show at APHA 2021. There's much more tomorrow, though, as we bring you coverage from the opening keynote, Reproductive Rights with Dr. Rebecca Gee, and more. Till then, you can find us here in the Colorado Convention Center, as well as in select hotels and on the virtual platform. And of course, you can always find us online. We'll see you right back here tomorrow. Mm